Hello, friends. Welcome to the Logistics of Logistics podcast. My name is Joe Lynch. Thank you so much for joining us today. On the Logistics of Logistics, I talk to experts in logistics and transportation, warehousing, fulfillment, supply chain, and of course, technology. And during these interviews, I'm always the one asking the dumb questions. I ask the dumb questions so you don't have to. Today's topic is big, bulky, and rural with my friend Grafton Elliott. Grafton is the founder and CEO of Onward, a big, bulky shipping network that helps retailers offer local-like delivery service to their customers located in suburban and rural zip codes. Onward helps big, bulky retailers and 3PLs offer their rural customers the same delivery, speed, quality, and service capabilities as their local counterparts. If you're struggling with big, bulky, and rural shipments, check out my conversation with Grafton Elliott. How's it going, Grafton? It's going well, Joe. Thanks so much for having me on. I'm excited to have you on. Grafton, tell us why we should care about big, bulky, and rural. But first, introduce yourself and your company and uh, where you're calling from today. Yeah, absolutely. So, my name is Grafton, CEO of Onward, and we're, I'm calling from uh, Denver, Colorado. It's where the company's based. And Onward's a platform that helps retailers and brokers that are focused on the big and bulky industry, so delivering items like furniture and appliances. We help those companies deliver items to their rural or suburban customers, which is around 20% of the population and growing. Cyber Monday was yesterday as we're recording this podcast, Joe, so there was likely a lot of customers that purchased online and got those next day, same day options. But there's a, that small population of 20% that usually doesn't have those urban like delivery speeds and options that we really focus on delivering for. Yeah, that's what we do. It's interesting when you said 20% before we hit record, you said 20% of the population doesn't live inside city centers, right? So now do you, does that mean they, they're not in the so I live in the Detroit metropolitan area. I would say I live on the fringes of the Detroit metropolitan area, but still consider Detroit metropolitan area. But I'm an hour from Detroit. So I would be in that. Not quite. It's no longer considered a rural area where I live, suburban. But again, it's an hour from Detroit. And I've always said, if you look at Detroit, I think it's like a lot of cities. It's almost like you put the whole population in a salad spinner and just spun and then we just went further and further from the city center. So where my grandparents lived in the city and then moved out to the suburbs, I moved an hour from there. (laughs) Yeah. So the, where you are is like the perfect scenario in terms of where we focus. So it's really, I wouldn't call it in the city centers, but more around, I would say 50 miles away from a city center is really our sweet spot in terms of where we focus. And so where you're located is, is where is definitely where we would help make deliveries too. Yeah. And by the way, when I was young, I remember driving out in this area one time and my dad said to me and my sister, oh, look, kids, look at those hillbillies. And there was these people throwing rocks down into the water. And we looked at that as if you live 50 miles from Detroit, you were, you were a hillbilly like my dad would describe. No, no offense to hillbillies listening. But today, if you live out here, it's not like you're lacking anything. Back then, you might not get Detroit TV. You might not be able to see. You might not be able to have. You might not be part of America. You're like in this rural area where you are like shut out from a lot of things. With the internet, who cares if you live out in the sticks? You can live out in the sticks and live a perfectly normal life. In the past, it would have been like, we don't get the newspapers out here. and We don't get, we don't get. TV stations. So we're about a month behind, but that's okay. We're happy with that. Yeah, that's exactly it. The pandemic has influenced a lot of that too, right? There a lot of people can work from anywhere now. Jobs are are mainly remote and in that population of rural, suburban, you know, outlying areas are growing at a one percent growth over this past year of just people moving out of the market. So these a lot of the population is new people that are moving and expect that same kind of urban delivery experience, but they're not getting it, especially in big and bulky with furniture and just be just for the, the many issues that we'll talk about today that um, allowed them to have them wait way longer than they would when urban area weeks instead of days compared to when they accept delivery. So you absolutely, you nailed it. And by the way, this is a larger demographic thing. Just keep in mind that people out further out from the city are more likely to have more kids. So we've seen this worldwide, especially in, in, in Europe and 
Asia, people moved to the cities over the last generation. And as they moved from the cities, they had a lot less, a lot fewer kids. And that is creating a demographic collapse in so many countries. Won't be felt here in the United States as much just because we're a settler nation. And we still have a lot of people who are suburban and rural, who are having lots of kids. It's hard to have lots of kids if you live in a very expensive zip code in a major city. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and I think that's the fun part about this, right, is that we're giving that we really see a lot of value in helping these comp- these these individuals that are locating these suburban rural areas. And as our platform grows and as we continue to, to build this technology, we're, we'll have more and more companies more okay, locally in suburban areas that are closer to city centers. But for right now, the niche that we've really found to be the most successful is in that rural zip codes. It's something that has been a, a, a tough uh, problem to solve for many to date. And you're not just doing just the suburban and rural, you're also doing big and bulky. Please explain what you mean by that. Yeah, of course. So we only focus on items that take two-man team, take a two-man team to deliver. So these are usually really heavy pieces of furniture, appliances, exercise equipment, cabinets, windows, remodeling, et cetera, where you need a two-person team to deliver. So highly nuanced deliveries, around 63% of the deliveries we're, we're doing, we're going to someone's home and actually setting up the unit inside of someone's home. So it usually requires some specialized equipment, specialized vehicles. So most of our deliveries are, are handled in box trucks with lift gates to give you an idea. So highly nuanced deliveries, not the least bit standardized in terms of what, what out is out there to deliver, but that's why we love it and why we've, we've been so excited by sticking within this niche of big and bulky because we see there's a lot of opportunity for automation. It is football season, so I've gone to... Uh, some football games in person at Michigan Stadium. I love it. But I also went and watched the Lions at my brother-in-law's house, 85-inch TV. And then I went to another football party on a few Sundays ago, 85-inch TV. So I come home and look at my scrawny 55-inch TV, and I think, i got to get a new one. They're very inexpensive, and I keep thinking, that 55-inch TV, I just picked it up put it in the back of my car. I don't even know if I can get an 85-inch TV in my SUV. So that is something that suddenly has to be delivered by someone like you. And again, that's it's all of a sudden, 85-inch TVs became normal. And again, I imagine it'll be 90-inch TV by the time you listen to this podcast. <laughs> So somebody's got to deliver those. And that's a two man job, I think. Absolutely is. Yeah, it all it, it absolutely is, especially if you want to handle it properly and, and carefully. And yeah, they're fun. You throw up, put them in someone's home. You can turn them on to make sure they're working at the time of delivery to get that white glove service, move all the garbage if we set it up. So it's a it's a changing world, right? Where everybody people are used to getting that that delivery speed and service for these small parcel items, but now people are starting to expect that same exact speed and quality for larger items, which is forcing a lot of us in this industry to adapt and iterate and find a way to make it work. And hopefully we're helping make help helping in that journey of getting us there. So Grafton, tell us a little bit about you. Where'd you grow up? Where'd you go to school? Give us some career highlights before you started onward. Yeah. So I grew up in, in Maryland, in Hartford County, Maryland, and went to uh, Towson University, which is right north of Baltimore, Maryland. Great school. Yeah, absolutely. We loved it. And shout out to their internship program because they got me the job that kind of started me down this <laughs> revolution of logistics. But what'd you study? Supply chain and then also marketing and the double major. But it was funny because when I got an internship at my the the brokerage that I ended up working for eight years, CDS Logistics, that I was I joined that company as a marketing intern. Worked there for two months, I was doing like social media ads. And I remember going to my future boss. And I said, well, it was a funny thing. I was in the network management room at the time when I was doing this marketing. So I had all these like supply chain folks around me that were calling people and solving problems and the energy. <laughs> yeah. And you've probably been in some of those like war rooms and, and freight forwarding at the energy. It was just like, awesome. I was like, I want to be a part of this. So I went to my future boss. And I was like, I, I like marketing and all, but I think I'm better suited to do the supply chain thing. Could, could I be a part of your network management team? And rest was history from there. That, that was an incredible experience at that company. I loved working for them. They 
I had a couple opportunities where I was able to manage their asset light divisions. We, we would partner with local moving and delivery companies to deliver our product. I managed the the network for them. And then also had a couple opportunities to be an entrepreneur with, at CDS. So I had the ability to open up various facilities for them where I'd go in, secure the warehouse, stripe the floor, bring in the racking and bring in the team to to run the operation, which is where I got like really an intimate look at what it takes to run a final mile op- operation in big and bulky. And it is tough. It is tough, Joe. I'm sure you talk to people. It's just such a tough industry. We were talking about before we hit record is I think to someone who hasn't done it, if you say to a local delivery, any anybody who runs a network and has a service area and you say, hey, Grafton, would you mind just going 40 miles outside your service area a few days a week? They'd be like, yeah, I mind, unless there's a ton of money. It's really hard. You have to make a business case for it. And I know, I don't know the science, but I know there's a lot, it's an art and a science to keeping your assets moving and profitable. And as soon as you start saying yes to everything, you're in real trouble. So I think the default mode, and they're smart to do it, I think the default mode for a lot of people who are managing assets is, no, we can't take on that new customer that needs that. It has to stay within our service area. We want density in our service area. Am I right to say that? Absolutely, you are. Yeah, I think if any carrier could focus within 25 miles and have enough density to run all the trucks they need to run a business, I think every carrier will be will be over the moon. Um, but it really what happens is a lot of carriers are forced to, not forced, but in many cases encouraged to cover certain zip codes that are in rural or suburban areas. And they usually cover them once a week or once every other week, these zip codes, just so they can in- inquire enough data or rather have that domino of capacity to make sure it's worth it when they go to these rural zip codes. But what ends up happening is carriers not having enough density to go to rural zip codes and then losing money is not making enough profit on these rural deliveries. And and that reverberates downstream into retailers and makes the retailers get and the brokerages that are working with them get slower service and and, and lower quality deliveries to these rural zip codes. So it's you're absolutely right when you say that. It's, it's so while you were at the company, you the seeds of Onward were so tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. So fun story that we at that company, I was intimately involved in like working with these carriers and I like loved working with these carriers. I became really an advocate for the carriers that are in our network. And the reason we started Onward is because we had an account at one point that to participate in that RFP to get the account, we had to expand our serviceable zip codes that our carriers were servicing by around 30%. So picture a carrier that was going from like Denver, Colorado to Breckenridge, he was probably going out there once a week, once every other week. But we were like, you need to go out there once a week, if not three times a week to to get this account. And we thought it was going to be great and the carriers agreed to it, but ended up being a problem because these carriers were going to these longer distance zip codes and losing money all the time going out there, complaining to me to earn more money for me to go back to the client. So at that point, it was it was like, there's a problem here. There's all these hundreds of carriers that are in each given given market going to these rural zip codes every week, losing money. Why are there 10 companies going to a zip code to zip codes when there probably could be just be two going to that zip code and, and going there with full trucks rather than sending 10 half empty trucks out to the same zip code? So we really knew there was an opportunity there to solve that problem, which is where we created Onward. And it, it's hasn't and, and Onward, it's funny how we've been around for four years now. And when we started, it wasn't like rainbows and butterflies because what we first started to do is we're like let's just solve this problem using the load board concept wow. like brute retailer <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> exactly yeah it, we were like we'll throw orders on a load board all the carriers can come in when a retailer broker has an order for a roll zip code all the carriers can come in and, and try to bid against them and claim them but what ended up happening is that no carrier would go to load board or where they would and then nine carriers of the 10 that would go wouldn't get the jobs. So they were like, I'm tired of going to the load board. So we ended up just becoming this call center that was like, we were just calling all these carriers. Do you have a truck going to Breckenridge? Do you have a truck going to Breckenridge? And it was not sustainable about when we did that about three, four years ago. And we were like, okay, if we're going to be able to do this, we need to be able to understand exactly who are the trucks that are going to these rural zip codes and, and what are the real time capacity that are on those, which has led us to solve creating the solution that we have now, which is we really have it found a way to do integrations with 
the various dispatching softwares that these carriers are working with, we use those integrations to get the data to understand where carriers are traveling in a given market, who is going to local areas in their real-time capacity. And then that control tower view allows us to do the things we're able to do today, which is really cool. So now they don't... Have- we were talking about before we hit record, we were talking about this whole idea of app fatigue. So for a long time, the technologists in the space who are again transforming the space, no doubt about that, would just say to a local driver, Hey, you know what? Download our app and it'll tell you what we want you to move. And after a while, if you were a driver, you had had that request a dozen times. And you're like, I can't download every damn map. And if I do, can I go into them every day? Am I getting logged out? And it became this, okay, app is not the answer. And we were talking about this, the idea of how many apps do you use on your phone, Raft, and how many do I use? And how reluctant are you to download a brand new app? Sometimes you feel like you have to, like if you go on, a, I just flew on Alaska Airlines. I was like, yep. I'll fly on them again because my kids live in Portland. So I was like, all right, I download Alaska. I know that's a good one. But if there's an airline that I seldom use, I don't want to download their app on my phone. You're, I mean, you're absolutely right. You said six apps is like the average. That Cuban that said that. I was telling you, <laughs> yeah. I saw him on Shark Tank and he said, I've researched apps. He goes, people all want an app because it's a hook. If I can get somebody to start using uh, my my app, I win. I, I'm I'm successful, but how many do you use? And I think Mark Cuban said, and this was on Shark Tank a few years ago, that people use six or seven apps. And then he said, what apps do you use on a regular basis? Yeah, it's so true. It's, it's the polar opposite in Final Mile because what's been historically the case is if you have, if you want to work with another brokerage or another shipper, you have to typically use their handheld or their app to to update their systems for their customers. So you end up having all these carriers that juggle seven different apps to be able to run their business, which is a true problem. It creates no economies of scale. And they're driving all day too. It's so true. And, have, and, and by the way, when you talk about big, bulky, and rural, as soon as you get out of certain areas, you're not going to have great internet access. So you're all of a sudden, can I even open the app and get done the, get the job done? Yeah. And well, many of these carriers that we work with or that, that are, have this problem are like the dispatchers are the ones deploying the, that are doing the routing and deploying and the, the volumes. It's less of a concern for the drivers, but still that problem of the, there's so much app fatigue in their regard. So how did you solve it? Well, the, the really cool thing is that we have watched the market in essence, solve it a little bit itself. And we've been able to support that. So the way I mean that by is that we've, there's been this wave of amazing dispatching technologies that we call dispatching softwares in the market. Also heard them called as like transportation management platforms that these, that different carriers use to run their business. Now you might've heard like dispatch track and fleet enable and some of the larger ones on the market. And what these companies do allow these platforms do is allow these carriers to use one technology to run their business and have all the carry all their different brokerages plug into that technology and get updates through it. And that's been amazing for the industry. It's been like an incredible wave of innovation. But the beauty of that is that that data that that d- platform is upholding is everything we needed onward to know where the trucks are traveling that we can match them with the right loads that come within our marketplace. So what we've done is actually integrated with these various dispatching softwares where, for instance, if you're using Fleet Enable to run your business, one of our integration partners, you can use your that technology to run your business from all your different brokerages and then get a recommendation. Say, I have a route going north, it's half full, go into some rural zip code, and we'll plug in and, and actually provide a recommendation and say, hey, this is an order that's 15-minute detour from your route. It's going to add an additional $200 increase your profit. We increase our profit margins for our carriers around 20%. Would you like to claim this? And then right then and there, they can claim the order or see it via email, push one button and get access to that revenue, which allows them not to juggle multiple different technologies. They can just keep using that, that same app they're using every day to run their business, which is really the, when I, we think the reason that we've been so successful is because our carriers, when they get a job from us, it's one button push and there's no emailing and exchanging to be able to get access to that. <laughs> yeah, I love that. And by the way, I was talking to the guys from Flock Freight, Oren Zaslansky. And one of the things he said is, we all are concerned about empty miles. We always talk about empty miles. Nobody wants their truck to drive 30 miles with no load. 
but we don't talk enough about half empty miles and we need to. So you're trying to get these guys to, if I'm leaving Denver to go to Breckenridge, you want him to be full most of the way. And that's good for the driver because he makes more money. It's good for, it's good for the customers because they're getting another capacity that wasn't out there before. It's also good for the environment. That's what we have to start thinking about is if we could just eliminate empty miles, how much good we would do for the environment. And by the way, increasingly the world is looking at the logistics and supply chain space and saying, how are you going to reduce your greenhouse gases? So this is a very nice way to do it. Yeah. Th- no, thanks for saying that. It's so true. Like we're a cool example of that is we have a couple of carriers, great examples. We have a couple of carriers in Denver that use our software and both of them usually have routes to go down to Pueblo, Colorado, which is three hours south of Denver. And they've usually been going down there with half empty trucks. And what our platform has been able to do is highlight that both of those carriers are going down to the exact same zip codes every single week. And how about they collaborate? How about they work together to send out one truck to Pueblo and not two? What that does is it doubles the profit for or the, the revenue which in turn increases the profit for the carrier that's claiming it. And for the carrier that's not doing that delivery, they still get paid because they're the contact for that shipper. So they have the ability to still earn that revenue and, and increase their bottom line without having to put all the cost of goods sold into actually getting down to play blows. There's all of these scenarios that are that our platform is unlocking as we continue to get more and more retailers that are, are dispatching softwares to join that are just making really sizable impacts to the environment. And really when it comes down to it, all we care about the carrier's bottom line to make them more profit. So let me understand that you gave us an example and that's interesting. I've never heard that before. So let's just say I'm getting paid $500 and I've got to drive 40 miles and you're getting paid $500 for driving the same 40 miles, but we're both half empty. You at Onward, you discover this, that two different carriers, Grafton and Joe, are going to the same place on the same day And you say you would reach out to one or the other and say, hey, Joe, take your load to Grafton and he'll deliver it. Yes, exactly. Or vice versa for retailers too. If a retailer has a a truck that's going. And I would still get the, I would still get the 500 bucks or how does this work? Yeah. So what we, you can, in our platform, you can set the rate that you would like the item to be delivered for. So a lot of our retailers or carriers that leverage that collaboration service, they say, I want to cover my warehousing costs because I didn't do the work in terms of receiving that product into my warehouse. So I'm not going to put it onto, I'm getting paid 500, but I'm not going to put it onto the marketplace for 500. I'll put it into the marketplace at 400 or 300. And that $300, whatever that comes out to is all bonus for that carrier. That's going to go down to play blow because that's just revenue. They currently, or they're going to go there regardless. And that's revenue they currently don't have access to. So it makes it this really cool, like win-win scenario where like, Carrier gets more money, shipper gets it done faster. No, that's not and this. I know this. We're not talking about over the road trucking. We're talking about the final mile, really. That's so. I'm thinking about from the retailer perspective. Are they saying, "Hey, wait, Joe was supposed to deliver it. Now he p- handed it off to Grafton. I don't know Grafton. I picked Joe." Or does that not matter because it's all within Onward? Yeah. So it's that's a great way to look at it. You're still re- Onward is responsible, not Joe, not Grafton. <laughs> Correct. Exactly. Yeah. Onward is the responsible party and that, that holds the insurance and, and holds the account we, we, that we hold to make sure the quality of our carriers is upheld. And I think that goes into like the whole quality piece too. It's like big, big and bulky quality is everything, right? I think it's, it'd be, it's not as much as small parcel where it's speed and cost where it's, it can cost a little bit more money and it can get out there a little bit slower, but if you're damaging the product, you will lose customers because that's really what everything cares about, just the cost of returns, cost of replacements in this market. But the cool thing is that when you ask these carriers that are in our platform, they're all fleets, they're all moving companies, delivery companies that are sending out routes of different household items every single day. This platform allows these companies to look on the technology and gain access to additional loads, which just creates a cool scenario. Because if you call a moving company if, if you're like Joe, I want to. Joe is like, I want to move something from Denver to Pueblo, and you call it a moving company. They're gonna say they're gonna give you the dedicated rate. They're gonna say it's like 800 bucks to get a delivery completed from Denver to Pueblo. But if you're able to call them and say, Hey, through this technology, I see you have route that's going down to Pueblo. There's a 15 minute detour from your route to claim this load. Would you like to claim this for 200? dollars They're gonna say yes every time. But then you get this amazing driver team that typically would be 800, dollars but for 200. dollars 
which allows you to really keep your quality high and which is why we have a 1% damage rated on, which is one of the industry lowest is because we're giving these incredible carriers access to loads that they otherwise wouldn't have access to. And they're the pros out there in the market. So when you say big and bulky, I, I know some of the things that we already talked about. So that would be like a mattress or a bed, electronics, exercise equipment. So if you bought a Peloton, my kids bought a Peloton, one of my daughters bought a Peloton. So they had, that would not come small parcel. That would have to be delivered by someone who's delivering big and bulky furniture. What else are we talking about when we talk about big and bulky? You pretty much nailed the big ones, but it's the other ones could be remodeling materials. So maybe windows, larger windows, doors, yep. kitchen cabinets that, that fall within that. Stuff scenario. we increasingly buy online. Yes, exactly. Yep. More and more. And I think, I don't know if you guys have gotten into it, but I used to think when I said direct to consumer in e-commerce were one in the same, but now I think about e-commerce as could just as easily be B2B now. So are you seeing some of that also? Yeah. So we, we have e-commerce in terms of it is really like focused on mainly for us is B2C. So we're delivering to the end consumers, but we do see a lot of scenarios where there's an opportunity to deliver to a cabinet designer or a, a different the delivery company that's in that market as well. So great example is we have had a really cool scenario that popped up when we first started the company that got me so energized about this business where there was a delivery from a vendor that needed to ship an item to a, a Steamboat Springs, Colorado retail store, B2B delivery that we needed to deliver from Denver to Steamboat Springs. That same retail store also had to deliver an item to Silverthorne, which is Colorado. It's like rough 70 and you go out, no, you go north to go to Steamboat. And so what we did is we basically said, okay, there's a route going to Steamboat to deliver this vendor's item to the retail store. That retail store has to deliver something to, to Silverthorne. And the same day the request was submitted, we picked up and delivered it out in like the middle of nowhere in the mountains of Colorado, just to show the, the power, like how powerful this platform can is and, and will be as we continue to grow. It is unlocking like next day delivery and same day delivery in, in areas that are used to waiting weeks and months for deliveries, which is the really exciting piece of the platform. I think also from the driver and the carrier perspective, probably for the last five years, we've, we've heard people, I've heard people say, oh, all you have to do is go in the morning, wake up, look at our app or go online and look. And, and that is how you're going to make extra money, which again is extra steps and it, and it sounds simple enough. You say, well, Grafton, wouldn't you go online to make an extra 200 bucks? And you go, yeah, I would. But at some point you're busy and your, your job is not to sit. Your, your job is to drive. So the idea of thousands, drivers and carriers suddenly changing their behavior to use your new app when they've heard that many times is, hey, you can make extra money doing this and this. And by the way, why don't you also deliver this while you're doing it? And, and again, it's been a common theme that you can make more money using this app. And I'm not even going to deny that. It's just, it's asking people to change their existing behavior. What you've done, you and your team has made it real easy where it just says, Joe, would you like to take a 15 minute detour and make an extra 300 bucks? And I go, yes, <laughs> that's, <laughs> I pressed a button. Yes. I can pull over and hit a button. Yes. For 300 bucks. <laughs> yes, exactly. It's that's exactly what we're trying to do. And you, and we're, and we're trying to make it so the people are willing to change their ways. Like you just mentioned, you made a really good point there. Like if you look at like most, how this is operated in every single market, it's every single brokerage and retailer usually works with one go-to carrier in every market. So you're working with one moving company in every market. That's how the business works. And the reason they do that is because big and bulky is highly nuanced. If you work with one carrier, they learn your processes, they understand what to do delivery. So by us introducing additional carrier network on top of that primary carrier, that can be uncomfortable for certain retailers to, to adapt to, like you mentioned. But I think the interesting thing that we've done, just like we just said, is we've made it easy for retailers uh, to, for rather brokerages to leverage this technology to have this additional secondary network at their disposal if there's a situation where that primary carrier can make the delivery. And we've done it in a way that's extremely user-friendly for the carriers 
which makes it, which makes this whole platform work. Uh, and I think that's why we've been able to change how people are running their business as we work with some of the larger forwarders out there in the market. And you said your sweet spot isn't necessarily the retailers. It's the brokerages, 3PLs and warehousing companies. Yes. So we work right now currently with some of the larger forwarders out there. Five of the top largest brokerages and 3PLs in the market are already in the Onward platform. We have an amazing partner in EFW, SSS Forwarding Group, and ArcBest, and also my old company, CDS, and others that are in that network that really allow their carriers to just focus on those super hyper local deliveries. And then anything that pops up in that suburban rural network, leverage our network to get those deliveries completed. And then that's really our sweet spot in terms of way we focus. But then also the cool thing is like right before this call today, EFW's team texted me and they said, hey, we're like a little over capacity in Chicago and we're looking like we're going to need help to find additional driver capacity. Beauty is that they can actually you know, unlock our technology for that as well, where we can come in and provide rescue capacity to help them get through a busy peak season like this we're dealing with right now as well. So that's definitely our sweet spot is those three PLs. We do work with some re- we do work with retailers, Slumberland Furniture, Living Spaces. Some of the lar- we work with five of the largest ten fur- furniture retailers out there. But these companies use us for those rural deliveries or rescue deliveries and give their primary business to these the brokerage partners that we have, which is, makes us really complimentary and exciting. And, and yeah, your last point there is we do this all with a carrier centric focus. So I think that's counterintuitive to what a lot of people say in the market that yes, our shippers are the one that pay us; they're the ones that are giving us volume to give to our carriers, but we do this all with the focus on our carriers, making sure that they build the empty space on the trucks or they're making sure their business is getting better day in and day out. And that actually ends up helping our retailers because the happier the carriers are, the the better performing the carriers are, the better service they provide to our, the retailers that ship items into our platform. So we all know that during the pandemic, we had a lot of people enter the market with Sprinter vans, Conline vans cars, all sorts of ways to deliver stuff to homes. And I think we also recognize that a lot of them, they were gig economy. They weren't sitting down with Excel spreadsheets and crunching the numbers and saying, how can I be profitable? I think now the ones that have stuck around are saying, yeah, I have to be profitable. I have to actually understand my costs better. And we see this in the trucking side of the the world is that a lot of smaller trucking companies end up driving, just saying, Hey, look, I'm not worried about, again, I'm not an accountant. I'm a driver. I'm going to go pick stuff up. I'm going to move stuff all day long. And maybe they take stuff for $50 or hundred dollars cheaper here, $200 cheaper there. And at some point they realize I'm not making any money. And I think that is a big concern that we all, you could say though, that's their problem. It's all of our problems. When they go away because they aren't making any money, we all suffer. And I think I remember working with one of the Japanese automakers uh, was one of my customers and when I was still doing logistics. And I remember they would always ask at the end of the meeting, they say, Joe, be honest with us. Are you making money? And I was like, yeah, we are. And they're like, are, are we, is there margin on all of our, on this business? Tell us now because we really like working with you. And I was thinking, they're, are they asking me to raise the price? No, not necessarily. That was not good. But they liked working with us. We had that relationship and they wanted us to stay in business. We don't always act like that. There's a lot of carriers out there who are suffering in this market. And what happens, and I'm talking more of the truckload right now, but it, I'm sure it applies to the final mile, is are they going to start cutting corners because we aren't paying them enough? Are they going to cut corners on safety, on wages, on regulatory stuff, licensing? We can't afford to have that. So we have to, again, everybody's got that mindset of, oh, I want to save 50 bucks. I want to save 50 bucks at what cost, <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. And these dispatching softwares that have been introduced to the market, like Fleet Enable and OnFleet and these companies that are out there, they allow these carriers to have this data that is that's aggregated from all these different softwares to really intelligently run their business financially and, and understand how much their money they're making per truck, how much money they should be making per truck relative to the mileages that they have. And I think that's going to help these companies survive that have adopted these technologies. And the beauty of too, is that 
every carrier that joins a dispatching software that we're integrated into, they get access to our marketplace. And, and on average, carriers make uh, 15% uh, to 25% increased net revenue every time they claim an armored load, just because of the work, the little work associated with it and the fact they're already going there. So if we can continue to use dispatching software to stand up the data needed for carriers to run their business intelligently, and then also help them um, deliver more efficient routes, especially to these cut corners types of deliveries. Like you said, like if the rural deliveries are typically the, the deliveries you cut corners on because you don't want to spend your time delivering orders that are not profitable. And if we can use that combination of increasing the data they have access to, and then also helping them make their routes more efficient and really just like filling space on trucks because there's tons of it out there. 35% of the time trucks are driving empty or they're parked in the yards, not working at all in this industry. I think there's just an incredible opportunity to help that piece of the industry. So walk us through a shipment. Let's just say right now, I just bought that 85, in, but no, never mind. 90 inch TV. I haven't <laughs> yes. seen one yet, but I want <laughs> one and I want it to be delivered. It, 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 I bought it online. How does that describe the process here? Yeah, I would love to. Yeah. Yeah. 90 for sure. We got to look at 90. <laughs> yeah. I think the way you can think of it, we've been using Denver to Breckenridge a couple times during this podcast. So maybe I'll just use that again. So say you're EFW and you have a, a TV that you need to ship from uh, that you're working with Sony or one of your clients and that you need to ship an item from Denver to Breckenridge or on the way back. Wait, who's, DF, who's DFW for people who don't know? Oh, EFW, sorry. The, the SS is forwarding group okay, of our okay. first adopters. Yeah. And they, what they will do is this, they'll look at their delivery options and they'll say, oh, wait, the carrier that we're partnering with doesn't go out to Breckenridge until two weeks from now, which means this customer is going to be angry and there's potentially going to be a, a situation where they would move away from us or create concern for the client. They log into the Elmer platform, they take the order and either through a manual entry or an API integration, they'll place the order in our platform and just move from Denver to Breckenridge. At that point, we will survey with our platform, the data will survey every single route that we're aggregating from the dispatching software we're partnering with. And we'll find the top three routes that make the most sense to claim that Sony TV. Those notifications go out to those dispatching, those carriers and those dispatching softwares. They'll see how many, how much minutes detour it is from their current route they have loaded into the dispatching software. The first, the carrier that has the least amount of detour sees it for 30 minutes. Nobody else can see it other than that one carrier because we want to make sure carriers don't feel like they're getting that fatigue. So the carrier sees it, they claim it. They're like, yes, I'll add this 90 inch TV to my route. Order gets, the order gets claimed. It's now theirs. And the item information gets sent out to the carrier for them to go to the warehouse and pick up the unit and get it out there and send it on to their route. And all the training is managed through the onboard technology to make sure we know any special delivery instructions that we have to unbox it, set up the TV, all that fun stuff is handled through our technology. So it's taken a process that typically would be a bunch of emailing and phone calling. Yeah. And again, exactly. it's hard to find. You, you find yourself asking almost a favor of your carrier network and asking them to do stuff that they don't want to do. They're going to charge you more. They don't have expertise in that. Yeah, that's... So you work with, again, you mentioned Estes, but you work with lots of 3PLs, brokers, and warehousing companies? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, so... Absolutely. The, go ahead. So sorry. if they're listening, what does it take to get start working with Onward? So it's, a, it's very easy. We've had clients say yes and and get working with us within 24 hours that are in that bigger brokerage business. We it takes a sign up, log into our platform to be able to get through the proof of concept where you can see the magic in motion of matching with, lo with loads. After, But to get set up, we just have to get your certificate of insurance that so we'll, we'll actually submit to you a certificate of insurance with your name listed to make sure you're covered for all damages required in our platform. If so, and then... As soon as you place an order and you, you say yes to the integration, we'll get our systems plug, plug, plugged in where we'll be a carrier option for you to select in whatever uh, TMS platform you're using. And we'll be a backup option for you to handle your, your hopefully your emergency situations pop up or your longer distance deliveries. And then to that, it, it's a one API integration. We've had it set up in four hours before to give you an idea. And also but commonly it takes a week to set up. And the other piece of the two, the other I would say for who they are listening is every dispatching software that joins our platform, the data increases, the services we're able to provide to our clients increase. 
And for every dispatching software that's currently not plugged into us, we see this as a, an incredible added differentiator for you, where you can tell your carriers that you're going to pay for your licensing fee, you're paying for your dispatching software by claiming loads on the our marketplace. So if you're a dispatching software that's out there that's not plugged into our platform already, please talk to us because we feel like we can provide such a massive benefit the more and more we connect. And you gave them capacity that they would not normally have, but also it's just, it's a little different when you're talking about rural or the, the edges of suburbia. And increasingly, you mentioned Denver and Breckenridge. I was thinking, I, I've made that trip from Denver to Breckenridge a dozen times by car. It's not easy to drive out there. And I was thinking, then you still mentioned steep boat. I'm thinking all of those ski towns I've been to, that's ridiculous to have to make that trip. <laughs> that's, that's scary <laughs> in a car. And I, so I keep thinking, yeah, that's, but that's the same where I'm, again, I was talking to you before we hit record. I'm in the Detroit fringe of the Detroit metro area. And increasingly a fast growing area in Michigan is Traverse city and it's affluent. And it's a big county that's four hours north of Detroit. We also have Grand Rapids, which is on the west side of the state. It's an hour and a half, 40, hour and 45 minutes from my house. And I keep thinking, everybody in those areas, nobody in Grand Rapids or even the suburbs of Grand Rapids thinks I live in the sticks. They think, I want a 90-inch TV too. <laughs> and I want it delivered. <laughs> Yes, exactly. I mean, it's, it is, it's, ha- you're, you nailed it. It's absolutely happening everywhere and these customer expectations are, are growing. And so it's, yeah, we love the ability to be able to help those clients that are located in those areas. And it's, it just gets better. It's a guaranteed, it's every order that gets joins. We're doing 700 orders a day right now and through our platform into these areas. And it's just every time we can get more clients and more data, it makes it fun to manage this business. Cause as you know, like we've been, at this for four years now, but really been in market for the last year and a half since we've had this data and it's been fun since we've been able to have it. So are you software as a service or how do you guys make money? Yeah, so we we do both. So when you join our platform as a carrier uh, through an integration partner, you pay for a platform fee just to gain access to the, the marketplace. And that allows us to offer a very low margin between what the, because we take a transactional margin between what the shipper pays us or the broker pays us and then we'll be actually end up paying the carrier that claims that load but it's a very small margin with that platform fee so we make money on a combination of that platform fee and and also the margin we take i love it between transactions and it's funny before we hit record i was saying if there's a 3pl and then onward and then the carrier that's a lot of mouths to feed you have three three companies that are let's say they're in transportation that want to be paid you pointed out that what you are so often doing is you're actually, when you consolidate these loads, there's a lot of value at it because now instead of two $500 loads, now I've got one that's, I don't know, $800. It's a, it, you're adding a lot of value in that you're not just a middleman. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. We're the, we we're taking because carriers the partner with one carrier in every market, that one carrier is who they're getting the quote from to deliver those longer distance deliveries. So if they say it's $800, that's just because they don't have access to all the other carriers that are going to that zip code already, which is what we're, we're unlocking for them. And we've taken deliveries that are typically 800 and we're doing them for 150 $200 next day. And it allows people to, it allows a lot of money in the middle to be able to make sure that the carrier is getting paid handsomely. And then also the, the retailer's the broker is getting paid handsomely. It creates a lot of margin that's just currently not available in the market because of how siloed the relationships are that we're truly unlocking. And it makes it fun because it gives them these companies access to so much more revenue that they they wouldn't have access to otherwise. I love it. I love it. So what I'll do, Grafton, I'll put a link to your LinkedIn profile. I'll put a link to your website and any other links you and your marketing team give me. I'll put those in the show notes so people can reach out and talk to you. Grafton, I like to interview the rock stars of this industry. People like you, who else should I interview? Yeah, so I have two companies for you if we have time. So the the first one I have to mention is you should talk to Eric Owen at ShareTown. So ShareTown's a a company that helps big and bulky retailers that are in the furniture and exercise equipment industry automate their returns process that they're receiving. So if you have a client that... I love it. 
it's he's their company is really amazing where they found this way to make the unit economics work finally in the circular economy world of returns in big and bulky where they actually have these reps that are college educated reps usually that go and pick up items from the customer's homes and bring them back to a storage unit and then resell them on the circular economy through Facebook marketplace or another item, what have you. And it creates this kind of win scenario where the partner gets paid, the rep gets paid, and then Sheraton makes their money and it works. That team is incredible. They're growing like rocket fire right now. And it's they're just the executive team and the whole team there is incredible. So definitely would mention them because they're excellent. They're just a really cool company that's solving a problem that, yeah, nobody else has, has found a way to solve effectively. And the other one I'll mention is two boxes. So led by Kyle and, and Aaron there. Uh, they're a returns company as well, but not in the big and bulky industry in the clothing and apparel industry. So they've done a really amazing job of of finding a way to automate the process of when items get returned back to a physical uh, sword and ships or consolidation plant and restickering, relabeling, and then doing what needs to be done from an automation standpoint in the warehouse to be able to get that back out into the circular economy and resold again compared to items being thrown into a warehouse into a returns area for share town. And then also items just being completely trashed for two boxes because there's the heck they can't be effectively relabeled and brought out into the circular economy. So really cool companies that are helping solve some niche markets there. I think we, we said this uh, before we hit record is we have such a problem with returns. And I I've said that on my podcast before. every time somebody says free returns or free shipping, I always think uh, there's some VC <laughs> gaining a gray hair and the free return, the returns we've gotten, we've trained um, consumers that if you don't like it, just send it back. And people are treating e-commerce like it's a changing room. I'll get three, three sweaters and I know I'm returning two, or I'll get medium, large and extra large. I'll try all three on and I'll send two back. I don't care because you don't size it. That's your own problem. And with the big and bulky, it's even a bigger problem because when you think about these mattresses, if people buy mattresses online. I have not done that, but my kids have. I keep thinking if you get it, oh, I tried it out for 30 days or 28 days. I don't like it. Come get it. That is tricky. So, but there's somebody out there going, you know what? That bed's been used for three weeks and I'll get a nice discount on it and I'm in college and that seems just fine by me. <laughs> oh yeah. And you take care of them too. They, they'll sanitize them when they're picked up and re and oh, yeah. them, make sure they're, yeah. And it's cool because for us, every time a pickup happens, that's in a rural suburban zip code. We work with share as close partners where we are able to reverse logistics, those items back to the city centers and get them picked up and brought back to their rep. So it's a cool, partnership we love that partnership because it helps these rural customers get access to free 30-day return policies easier which they just like currently don't have access to it so it's a really cool partnership there as well i love it so what conferences will we see you and the onward team at this year we'll be at manifest i'll see you there yep Joe, i'll see you there for like sure <laughs> and eca will be at the eca conference where, where what is eca eca is for as a carrier focused a courier focused conference and they're just in april in phoenix i believe this year not um, too shabby but yeah really look look forward to that one really the beauty of it's Work we work with carriers to make them to fill the space on trucks. So being able to work with them to get them plugged into the platform is really the focus of that conference. And we're always at home delivery world. We never miss that every year. We've been going there for four years. So when is that? See you all the, that's in June it's in Philadelphia last year. My I actually don't know where it's going to be this year, but I'll, well, you'll I'll, be but, there. But yeah. <laughs> I'll be there. <laughs> I'll Excellent. Be there. Excellent. <laughs> Excellent. Well, Grafton, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. And what I'll do, again, I'll put a link to your LinkedIn profile, link to your website, any other links you give me, and I'll see you at Manifest. But thanks just so much for coming on the podcast. Cool. Glad to. It's really an honor. Thank you, Joe. You've done, thank you for everything you do for this industry. It's incredible what you do every week. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. My podcast is only as good as the guests I can get. So I've, I've been very blessed in that. And I'm not seeming to run out. I just keep finding new people to talk to. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Absolutely. Hey, have a great rest of your day. Talk to you soon. And thank all of you for listening to my podcast. Your support's very much appreciated. Until next time, onward and upward.
You have been listening to the Logistics of Logistics podcast, where we engage with leaders in the logistics and supply chain community. If you like what you hear, please subscribe, hit the like button, and leave us a nice review on Apple or Spotify or wherever else you listen. Also, please check out our videos on YouTube and connect with us on LinkedIn. We're very big on LinkedIn. And you can also reach us on the logisticsoflogistics.com, our website.